Welcome to Salon Talks. I am Mary Elizabeth Williams, and I am sitting here next to Guy Branham. You know him. He's a stand-up comic. He's the creator and host of True TV's talk show, The Game Show. He's the host of Pop Rocket Podcast. He's done like a million other things. I can't even like I got I got this list of things that I could have said about you, and I was like, I have to throw that up because Ev everyone. It, Everyone has to have nine jobs now yes. in this fragmented media landscape. Everybody has to have nine jobs. You got side hustles for days. <laughs> you got all side hustles. And now he's a memoirist. And his new book is called My Life as a Goddess, a memoir through unpopular culture. And if you want to read a book where you can get six pages worth of breaking down Bohemian Rhapsody and a cobbler recipe... <laughs> This is a book for you. It's a very solid cobbler recipe. <laughs> if you live in the South and you have access to Southern, like low gluten, um, uh, uh, like self-raising flour, yes. it's it'll be even better. And it's super easy. I have yes. to say, I'm, I bake. I was like, he knows he knows his stuff. Yes, the man knows what he's talking about. Yeah, here. a lot of people are coming at cobbler from a crust tra tradition. I'm a batter man. Yes. I come from a bat batter people. Don't you think that that makes it more of like a pan dowdy though? Controversial opinion, go. I only know the cultural context I come from when it comes to baked fruit desserts, and this is what we always defined as a cobbler. Cobbler's crisps, brown betties, like, and My family's and from Arkansas. They don't screw around with any of those other things. We're never crumbling anything over the top of anything. Okay. We just have what we know to be a cobbler. This, this is, uh, welcome to Salon Talks, it's a uh, cobbler <laughs> We're only, you didn't know I was just going to give you 20 minutes of cobbler talk, did you? I mean, I've got some opinions, <laughs> but I have such a narrow construction of cobbler. I mean, once you stray out of peaches or blackberries, I don't even know what we're talking about. And only fresh peaches. You're very, <laughs> you're very traditional about that. I, look, yes. we could go all day, but let's, let's talk about some other stuff, too. Like, let's talk about this book in general right out of the gate. You say something that I feel is very, very important right now about when you are denied your space in this world, you have to figure out ways make it. Yeah, own. and I, I think everybody to some extent is told like, oh, this part of you is wrong or you're not welcome in this aspect of the world and you just have to figure out how to manage that for yourself and it's an annoying job but it's a job we all have to do. And I'm wondering, because you talk at specific points about being in the moment in 2017 as you're writing this book and mm -hmm. I want to know how did our larger culture affect your decision to write this book and put it out in the world right now? Because you've been doing this a long time. Right, and there were some aspects of our larger world, I think you know what we're talking about, that I didn't talk about specifically because um, politics right now is like such an overwhelming wave that is like skewing our perspective on everything. We're having to figure out like, is history changing right now? Um, and if I were a braver man, I would have tried to address that in some way, but I wasn't. Yeah, Guy, why didn't you fix the world for it? Why didn't you write a book that fixed everything? But I, I feel like right now we all feel an obligation of like, oh, wow, what can I do to help fix the world? Because if we just wait for the systems that are in place to do that, they're not going to do it. The systems we have in so many ways are broken. I really wasn't thinking about that. I mean, to me like the way that this book is sort of like in the now is how much the world has gotten better over the course of the past like 30 or 40 years while I've been alive. You know, the fact that when I was growing up, being gay was still illegal in a bunch of states. Like that there weren't gay people in media and, you know, and that it was just so hard to access other parts of the world that like learning about parts of the world that you weren't living in were really hard and it is much easier now, but this is sort of like my struggle to like figure myself out and where I fit in the world. And doing it through the lens of, of pop culture, the way that you, um, for example, I wanna talk about how you approach talking about your father mm -hmm. through the lens of a film. Yeah, so my dad died like two years ago and I wanted to write about my relationship with him. And I, it was the first chapter I wrote for the book. I was just trying to figure out what this book would be, and I was like, well, here's an exercise. I'll watch what I know is his favorite movie. I'd never watched it before, uh, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. It's a Western from 1962. And I was like, I'll watch this movie, and then maybe try to figure out some way of writing about it. And then I watched the movie, and the movie is entirely about our relationship. Um, so I, it really gave me a structure to talk about my complex relationship with this man, I loved and like had hard times with in, in so many ways. And I think one of the, when you 
I didn't grow up with stories about people like me. Like people like me were never protagonists of stories. I was gay. I was fat. I was weird. Uh, I was, you know, like very academic in my approach to everything, and and that just, you know, you, we don't tell stories about people like me for so many reasons. So I had to look at stories that were about people who weren't like me and figure out how they related to me. And so that's how I tried to figure out telling my own story here was looking at the stories that influenced it. And you really interrogate the idea of masculinity in this book and what it means to be a man. You talk well, about the expectations honestly because, on you. Honestly, because masculinity has been interrogating me my entire life. Like. Uh, I, I talk in the book, I'm sorry for interrupting, but I talk... It's your, no, it's your talk, we're here to talk to you guys. No, but I talk in the book about the way that, like, when I was growing up, absolutely everyone was constantly asking me uh, if I wanted to be a football player. And I was like, what is this obsession? Why do you think that it is so important that I want this thing that's, let's be honest, is never going to happen to anyone in this town? Um, and I do feel like we take for granted how much all of us are constantly challenged and questioned by masculinity. Um, and it's, I'm sure there's some other like form that it could take where it would be great, where it wasn't constantly trying to shove other people into their place. But as it is right now, I'm not a huge fan. <laughs> and you, another thing that it was also, uh, for people who haven't yet read the book, but maybe they read your really amazing New York Times op-ed about this, you talk about what it means to have your voice in the world. And your voice is not just your identity, your writing, it's literally your voice. Yeah, I mean, for members of like other types of minority groups, your like your difference is immediately visible when somebody looks at you. But for gay people, that aspect of our lives isn't necessarily readily apparent from looking at us. And so frequently, it is our voices, our clothing choices, our expressive choices that define us. And so frequently, like straight cis people will come at it from a perspective of why do you have to do that? Why are you being like that? Why can't you just be normal? Um, and, you know, it's, it's really rough to, to say to somebody, oh, hey, I'm, we wouldn't discriminate against you if you just turned yourself into a, like a zombie facsimile of a straight person. And I think for so many gay people, that's what we end up doing is trying to find the ways of hiding ourselves. And so it can be hard to push through that and express ourselves honestly, like in the tone of your voice, but also in the content of your speech or, or what you're talking about. Yeah, and another thing that I, I really love about this book that I think makes it unique and makes it radical uh, in its in a really important way is you just, without making it about politics, talk about the women in your life who have been so instrumental and who have been mentors to you. Mm -hmm. And your career, in so many ways, has been defined by women like Chelsea Handler, yeah. Joan Rivers, Mindy Kaling. The thing is, is that male comics never gave me those opportunities. They always saw me as somebody who was fundamentally unlike them. F straight female comics could have had the, the same opportunity to dismiss me, and they, they didn't. Like, all of the good opportunities that have come in my life has so frequently been from, you know, uh, women in my industry, and I appreciate that so much, and I, I try to do what I can to sort of, like, give that back in whatever ways I can, both to, to other gay people, but also to women, <laughs> like, because I understand, I feel a little bit guilty about the fact that I was getting opportunities that these women could have been giving to other women. And all of them did support other women as well. I just feel like, you know, a little bit guilty that someone was nice to me. <laughs> You gotta, you gotta push through that one. Yes. Okay, but I mean, you talk about that too. You talk about like being, being in the rooms and being at the tables and hearing someone say to you, like, "Well, if only five percent of people are gay, like maybe your material isn't really resonating with other people." Yeah, Kumail Nanjiani, uh, who co-wrote uh, *The Big Sick*, who's um, in Silicon Valley, he had the best line about this. He said essentially, like, "I know that." white people can watch a movie through my eyes because I've had to spend my whole life watching movies through their eyes. And I think for some people, when they look at somebody who is not a heterosexual, cisgendered white guy, they don't understand their, our perspective as universal in, in the way that we've all been trained to assume that white guys' perspective is universal, you know? Um, and for me, that's it's been hard because we don't really have successful gay male stand-up comedians because we are not used to that perspective. We are not used to gay guys being the person saying the joke. We're used to gay guys being the object of the joke. Um, so, 
you know, I, but I also think we're, we're growing up as a country and the bad things that we are going through are forcing us to grow up faster and I hope better. Yeah, you know? you, I mean, you talk about revisiting a, a seminal album, a comedy album that you uh -huh. loved when you were a little boy and listening to it again as an adult and going, whoa. Yeah, like uh, the Eddie Murphy Delirious special is like the thing that made me want to be a stand-up comedian. Like it made me fall in love with sort of like the agency and singularity of perspective that comes with stand-up comedy. And so like a couple of years ago, uh, I was in an apartment on the Upper West Side and I didn't have anything to do and I was like, I will rewatch this on streaming. And it was on YouTube and I watched it and the first like five minutes were just him talking about how gross gay men are. And it was like, oh, this thing that made me love stand-up comedy also taught me to hate myself. That's a complex situation because I can't dismiss either of those things. So, you know, I think it is important, like right now as we are like re-examining so many like pieces of culture that came to us from people who were messed up, we're having to sort of re-examine what the places of those pieces of culture are. And for me, I can never dismiss Eddie Murphy Delirious. It did a really important thing for me, um, but it's also important to remember that like, its perspective also screwed me up. Yeah, and you you have a great line in the book that I love so much that I intend on quoting all the time about when you, you talk about how nobody teaches you how to be gay, and it's like, everybody teaches you how to be straight. That's what 80s movies where somebody rapes and, uh, somebody else are all about, really. Yeah, I mean, there are all of these things that are giving us signals about how we're supposed to behave in the world, and I didn't really have those things. Like, every movie poster is a little bit telling you how heterosexuality works, and for gay people, I mean, it's a little bit neat that we've been living outside of the rules for such a long time, but I also think it means that we're having to figure everything out for ourselves, and it would be nice to have, you know, it's nice that we have these boring rom-coms coming out that, um, like Love, Simon, where a 16 Did you call Love, Simon boring? Oh, yes, I thought it was <gasps> very boring. Right, get, get, cut the mic, That's to get his mic, that's it, we're done with this. No, <laughs> what you wanna watch is Alex Strangelove on Netflix. That is also very good, yes. It is very good, it's got jokes, it's okay. got perspective, it's got, like, here's the difference. In Love, Simon, he's talking about Radiohead obsessively, I think. Find me that 16-year-old gay boy. But in Alex Strangelove, they're like obsessed with the B-52s and Dusty Springfield, and I'm like, that is how gay boys work, like an obsession with culture that they're not supposed to like. You know what? I, I'll allow it, guys. Okay. <laughs> but what, did you really, you liked Love, Simon a lot? I really did. Why? Um, because I was coming at it from the perspective of a parent of teenagers who has a lot of teenagers in my life, who mm -hmm. knows that culture very well, and who also really loves teen comedies, and I thought that it was a really great teen comedy, teen romance that also happened to be a movie about a gay boy as the protagonist in the role that would usually be played by the awkward girl. Yes. And I thought that was amazing. Two points. And funny. A, I am not a Jennifer Garner fan, but that scene oh. with Jennifer Garner. We gotta get back to talking about cobblers. It's so good. It's go so bad. <laughs> um, but, but, like, a little bit the problem is that just happens to be gay. And, like, we're mostly the same, but not the same. And having those little shreds of culture that makes something feel legitimate, like it's coming from a, a real place that this, because so frequently we have gay characters in film or TV who are written by straight people and performed by straight people, and I just want that little bit of texture that lets me know that there is reality to this person, that they have had, that this character has been built with some degree of real gay experience, you know? I, I totally get it. I, I, when I wrote about the film, I said that I thought that it was a film that was both groundbreaking and just another great teen comedy. Yeah. So, um, so I hear it. And you know what? I also think we're, we're on a line, right, where the things that were, you know, really groundbreaking 10 years ago now actually make us cringe in yeah. some ways, right? Like Ugly Betty. I watch Ugly yes. Betty now and I'm like, oh, this, there's a lot that is very offensive about Ugly Betty. Yeah. But 10 years ago, it was like, this show is revolutionary. Right. So. No, it's hard. Look, I want to believe that Ugly Betty is still as good as it always was. You, you may find it problematic if you go back, Guy. Not, uh, as, not as problematic as Delirious, but you may find it problematic. Well, I mean, th that is a problem. There are so many things that we just considered to be like go-to jokes that we didn't think about the ramifications of them. Like, 
you know, trans people have been the butt of jokes in television for the past 30 years. It's how most people, kn like, learned everything that they know about trans people are these bad jokes written by cisgendered, like, uh, writers, you know, in a room who had never, like, experienced trans people. And it's why it's so important that there are so many more voices now changing the conversation and giving it real perspective. So speaking of that, and speaking of, I, I could talk to you all day and I have no long, I, I can't, but I want to ask you one more thing because a apropos of all of this, another thing you really talk about is body image in this book. Yes. And about fat shaming. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering how you feel like the culture is changing in that direction. I've been really fascinated with the conversation around this Netflix move, teen movie, Insatiable, mm -hmm. and the previews for it, and people saying, is this a movie about fat shaming? And I wonder, like, where do you, I mean, we obviously still have so far to go. Yeah. But the the fact that there are now communities of people who can organize and gather on social media and, and point things out to and educate other people. Well, it's so interesting because if you say anything that questions the way that we talk about fatness, everyone wants to say, oh, but people's health, oh, you're ignoring health. I, I, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about making people feel bad for existing. Like. Um, we have a construction of fatness in media that says the only worthwhile thing you can do while being fat is fighting as hard as you can to not be fat. And I just want to say, hey, you're allowed to do other things as well. You, uh, and it's a little bit unfortunate that we were talking about Unsatiable and not something like Dietland, which is so good and is about a person uh, with a, a perspective and hopes and dreams that are exist outside of the fact that she is fat. Um, you know, I, I haven't watched Insatiable, but the whole notion that, like, this magnificent dream that the fat person can unfat themselves and then they get to be a human being, I think, is damaging to people who are just trying to have lives along the way of having the body that they do. Um, and, you know, somebody else's body is not your deal. Like, um, and I think in so many ways, when it comes to reproductive rights, when it comes to, like, sexuality, we can forget that and believe that there are some bodies that belong to all of us. Um, so, you know, people just need to calm down a little bit. It doesn't need to be quite so terrifying for fat people to go to the gym or get on, on an airplane. 100%. Um, guy, I, I, like I said, I, I want to keep talking about cobblers uh, after we, <laughs> and, and pies and all of that. Yes. But in the meantime, uh, I'm going to let you go. Oh. Uh, the, I know. Uh, the book is called My Life as a Goddess, a memoir through unpopular culture. And if you want to, if you want more of all of this wisdom and you also want to know what this guy thinks about Ed Sheeran's The Shape of You, <laughs> he has a lot of thoughts. He has a lot, a lot of very nuanced takes on it, not just like over multiple um, parts of the book. Uh, then you absolutely need to read this book. Guy, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for us. having me. I really Pleasure. appreciate it.